So yeah. with the intro, what do you, do you have any preference? No, do you know? I okay. don't care about anything. Okay, cool. Yeah. Welcome to the Outdoor Entrepreneur <laughs> Interview Series. My name is Garrett. Uh, this is a series where I talk to cottage industry brands just about what goes on in their business. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Fritz Howard. Fritz is the founder and owner of Melanzana, located in Leadville, Colorado, which is where we're at today. So Fritz, I want to thank you for your time yeah, and absolutely. being a part of this. Nice to see you, buddy. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, thank you for the opportunity and for the, the candor. Um, so let's just kind of get into the start of Melanzana. And I guess even, let's get into a general overview for people that don't know, what is Melanzana? Sure, yeah, Melanzana is a small apparel brand. Um, we're in Leadville, Colorado, and we're just totally local. We cut and sew and sell all our apparel here in our building in Leadville. And it's primarily fleece-based, right? You work a lot yeah, with Polar yeah. Tech. Yeah, mostly Polar Tech fabric. When was Melanzana founded? Uh, 1994. So 28 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you lived in a teepee, right? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I had a, an office. Um, sometimes I'd sleep in the office, but my bedroom was a teepee that we had hidden up on the hills above town. Yeah. Yeah. So did you move to Leadville with the intent of starting a company, or did you move here and then you you know maybe needed some extra cash or something like that no absolutely it was my plan to like start making gear of some kind for sure yeah where did that need come from for gear uh it's more just like a passion i think of mm. just like you know i grew up in a family that um was pretty handy and we made a lot of stuff ourselves um just for the fun of it so i had that interest um, you know, and I grew up backpacking and stuff, so. Yeah. So, you know, I just combined those. And, what uh, kind of yeah. stuff did your family make? Uh, well, my mom used to make her own clothing, so I learned to sew from her. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, we grew up um, with a place in Vermont that we built by hand over the course of 15 summers. Whoa. Yeah. Was it, like, a log cabin? Yeah, a log cabin. We, like harvested stones from the creek nearby to build the foundation, mm -hmm. cut down all the trees, hauled them to the site Whoa. with our Suburban. Yeah? And yeah, it was cool. Dang. And uh, yeah, just, it was a long, slow, fun, fun way to spend summers for nice. sure. Nice. Yeah. Um, so before coming to Leadville, you know, you, you said that you had the intent of starting a business. Did you have any business experience prior to moving here and doing Melanzana? Uh, no, I was in my mid-20s. I'd uh, spent a couple years teaching school, which was fun, but just not my kind of work, really. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I did a little ski bumming and ended up here. Yeah. Yeah. So did you start with the microgrid or like with fleece wear or did you make other things and kind of move to that material eventually? Uh, I start, I was making more technical gear at the time. I made like Gore-Tex over mitts and gaiters. Um, everyone needed gaiters back in the day, all the skiers, because we all skied in leather boots. Okay. If we were telemarking in the backcountry. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, I made Gore-Tex bibs, um, you know, with side zips and all this built-in stuff. Um, and then it just kind of evolved yeah. into what it is now over time. Nice. Yeah. So was it, it was originally just a retail store. I mean, it still is a retail store, right? But who were some of your first customers? Um, yeah, originally it was a super small retail store, like 300 square feet on a side street in mm -hmm. Leadville. I had this rental, it was, I mean, level was super cheap back in those days. So that's part of what made it work for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I kind of started it with my buddy, Kevin, who I grew up with. He was a rack guy down in Buena Vista at the time. Um, so we made fleece stuff for his rack guide buddies. Um, mm. That was one of our first gigs. And then I opened a little storefront yeah. and started selling to local people, really. And it's just yeah. kind of built up from there? 
Yeah, baby steps. Yeah. 28 years of baby steps yeah. for sure, yeah. Um, so it's still retail and you don't have any kind of e-commerce side to the business at all. Right, we used to sell on the internet mm -hmm. some. Um, we had a website for a long time, well, we still do. But it was, you know, 10, 15% of our sales. Yeah. And then there was a time a few years ago where the internet really kind of started to draw inventory away from our store. Mm -hmm. um, and we had nothing to sell, so we kind of had to choose one. Yeah. And, and we've always been a store first. Um, and we're part of the downtown business community. Mm -hmm. um, so we feel a responsibility towards that. Um, that's, that's always been our primary focus. Yeah. yeah. So you're prioritizing the in-store experience rather than someone just being able to order it online and not really having any kind of, I guess, interaction with your local community. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've done that as a choice. You know, yeah. We made a clear choice to emphasize the store. And our store is pretty unique because mm -hmm. We cut and we sew and we sell all in the same building, so I don't know. I think you know, I, that's, yeah, that's kind of it's a significant part of what the brand is. Yeah, that people don't realize if they're from out of state or whatever. Right. So yeah. you guys have a two per customer limit right now. Um, yeah. Is that just based on the the production capacity, or is it like an arbitrary number that you came up with? Or? Yeah, it's based on. You know, we just want to get as many, as much product into as many people's hands as possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one just doesn't really seem worth it. So, two, at least you get two. Yeah. Um, but that allows us to get as many people in the store as we can. Um, because, yeah, we can't satisfy the demand. Right. Was yeah. uh, some of that limitation a response to reselling? Uh, yeah, maybe partially. Um, yeah, we do get people reselling our product, but it's a really small percentage yeah. of our overall volume. Like it's got to be less than one percent okay. that is online new being resold for for an elevated price, and, and we do try to discourage that. Like we watch for people who are doing that. Yeah. What What do you say to people that think, oh, this guy just needs to hire more people? We are hiring more people. Yeah, we're always growing. Uh -huh. um, but we're in a really small town, you know, and, and all of our employees are local. Yeah. Um, it's hard to bring people in from the outside to Leadville because it's a hard place to live. You know, yeah. It's 10,000 feet. It's, it's it was legit. Negative 14 this morning. Yeah, yeah. It was 14 below this morning. Yeah, I yeah. rode my bike to work. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's cold. Yeah, it's cold. Uh, and the altitude's hard. For, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You know, the other thing is, like, uh, industries tend to cluster together and feed off each other mm -hmm. or, like, or like businesses. You know, and we're, we're here alone. We're yeah. uh, in a clothing manufacturing desert. Mm -hmm. There's no other businesses like it. Even Denver has a really small really non-existent apparel industry um, so so yeah it's it's you can only grow so fast and we only want to grow so fast yeah yeah but but we're always pushing forward we're always making more stuff okay yeah are there any other like can you kind of talk to me about your intention of scale of you know not getting too big too yeah. fast yeah and you've clearly had very steady slow growth that has benefited you whereas you know, a lot of people could see the demand that you have and think, oh, you know, outsource the labor, outsource the materials, bring in more people, whatever you got to do, you got to meet the demand. But yeah. you've kind yeah. of chosen to keep it local and to yeah. stay slow. Yeah, you know, I think it's a assumption that growth is good, mm -hmm. right? In American capitalism, yeah, consumer businesses particularly. And uh, we don't really buy into that. You know, so we're not just going to grow um, unlimitedly. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the trajectory of a lot of small businesses or whatever, they, uh, there's a lot of them that grow too fast and then fail. Yeah. You know, so we're just always trying to find the right size mm -hmm. for our business. Yeah. Um, 
and you know we have this building in Leadville. It's seven thousand square feet plus a basement. Yeah. Um, we rented a neighboring space, so we're we're just took over a little bit of extra space, but you know we're trying to stay in that footprint. Yeah. And maximize. We want to maximize what we do here. Right. Um, and there's you know there's a limit to how many people we can really hire in, in this town. Um, so we're at 58 full-time employees, mm -hmm. 35 sewers or something like that. Yeah. And we're going to keep going. We're going to keep growing, but can you kind but of at, at a pace that's you know right comfortable and reasonable and, and makes sense for us. Can you expand on some of those economic factors that a normal customer might not think about or someone from the outside looking in? Which, yeah, you sure. Know, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, there's the housing situation, right? Uh -huh. And um, I think a lot of small towns. It's not just. Uh, mountain towns and resort towns. Yeah. But you see it all over the country, particularly during COVID, um, with remote work and uh, short term rentals is kind of a big thing these days. Um, it's taken a lot of long term rentals off the market. Yeah. In so it's hard to find a place to live and it's hard to buy a house right. here because, um, you know, I don't know, housing prices have tripled right. basically. Um, over the past few years. What yeah. about people that would say, oh, just charge more for the product so you can pay more to the employee? Yeah, yeah, you know, our product is, I, we've always tried to have value mm -hmm. as part of our product line, you know. So we raise prices when it makes sense, but, or, you know, when our costs go up, Yeah, for sure. Um, and our costs have gone up a lot in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, we want to make a functional, simple product that provides a good value for the customer. Yeah. So you think a uh, price increase would be kind of outside of that realm of value? Well, maybe a little one would be okay. Yeah. But yeah. what about yeah. like $200? No, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. For, it's not what we're all about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good move personally, because <laughs> I want to be able to afford them. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and I guess, you know, we'll just kind of continue on the demand aspect of things. With the market gap of your production capacity and not being able to, to meet the demand, there's a lot of people and companies that are moving into the exact same garment space to where the design language is the exact same, the materials are pretty much the exact same, and I, I want to know how you feel about that. Yeah, I try to be chill about it. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, you know, it's just a fact of life with the apparel industry. Yeah, you know, there's you, you can't patent or copyright a a hoodie. Yeah. So, so yeah, people are going to do what they do, and you just have to use it as motivation to be better, right? Yeah. Just keep keep improving and keep moving forward. What yeah. does being better look like for Melanzana? Uh, well, a lot of it's internal. Yeah. You know, a lot of our improvements come like on the production side and, and just trying to be more efficient and, uh, you know, build a really good, strong staff, which we have. Our, you know, yeah. our staff is amazing. We have a lot of talent in this building. Um, and, you, and, and yeah, you know, we're just going to keep moving our product line forward. It's slow. We're kind of more like yeah. a Levi's than a fashion brand where we kind of make the same old staples but yeah but we're definitely have a lot of stuff in the pipeline and and we'll be moving forward moving our line forward over the next couple of years are you sure. gonna continue making different types of fleece oriented stuff or are you looking at different materials um for the most part yeah it's gonna be soft goods like that yeah um you know in the past we made a lot of more technical products and products that like a wide range, we you know we've had 50 products over the years. Yeah, um, and we've had to cut back our product line. Yeah, in pa in recent years, just to kind of meet the demand, focus on our core products. How do you make that judgment call? Where you you as a creative and a creator, you know, I'm sure you have ideas that you want to pump out, but as opposed to doing that and expanding the SKU and the product line, you're focusing on what your customers want 
at the expense of maybe getting to new, do new things. So can you kind of talk about that decision? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you just have to make your best guess as mm -hmm. to what the best thing to do is, you know, and, and, and lately it's been less creating and more just focusing on production for yeah. sure. And then, you know, I'm definitely like hoping to bring it back and, you know, turn it around in the next few years and, and have a lot of new product. Yeah. What's the research and development look like for you? It's like me. Okay. <laughs> Cutting and sewing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a little uh, a CAD system uh -huh. to design the patterns. Um, so that's nice. So I use a computer, but uh, it's real slow. Yeah. You know, I, I take my time and we really try to get our patterns as dialed in as we can before we sell them. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a lot of experimenting and, and making product and getting it to fit the way we want to. Does it look like something that you want that you don't see? Or is it more calculated where you look at the market and kind of market trends and move in that direction? No, it's always been more what I want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, you know, we look for really good fabrics. Yeah. For sure. Um, we don't really take risks on experimental fabrics like it's it's very much like staples. Yeah. You know? Um, and then, yeah, if it's something I wouldn't wear, I don't make it. Right. Yeah. Do you think that that focus on not overly complicating things and just using quality product, quality design, and quality craftsmanship is kind of why you're as successful as you are? Yeah, I don't know why we're successful. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, I think our product line, it's simple enough that it appeals mm -hmm. to a broad range of people. Yeah. Which is kind of intentional, I guess. Because, um, you know, small brand, small town, you, we kind of had to spread out a little bit. And yeah. Not be too much of a, a niche. Um, uh, so yeah, and I think people just like, when you come into our store, you kind of understand our values. Yeah. And a lot of people connect with that. Yeah, I mean, you get, you see the product, but you also see all the sewers, which I'm sure we're picking up some of the background noise now. Your entire product or production team is behind the counter. Yeah. And yeah, as a customer, you can't see cutting. We hide them in the yeah, back. Yeah, right? yeah, they are in trouble. the very back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you guys don't really market either. I mean, I don't see paid ads for yeah. Melanzana. You haven't posted to Instagram. Not that that's the only place that people exist on the internet, right, but right. you know, yeah. it's a big kind of marketing tool these days. Right. So yeah, it's been a few years since we've done any advertising yeah. of any kind. And um, even back in the day when we did advertise, it was just purely local, yeah. Colorado based. We've never really tried to be a brand that's bigger than, than the local area or, you know, or the state. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, as long as we don't need to, we're not going to. Right. You know. Going kind of back to the labor force, you develop all the talent in house, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Most of our sewers, we train from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, some people don't make it in Leadville. Um, did, was there a time where people were moving to Leadville specifically to try to get a job at Melanzana? Uh, yeah, we've had a little bit of that, but we don't really advertise outside of town, so yeah. we don't get a ton of people, but we get a little bit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How do you know when it's time to bring on more hires or start training people? A lot of it is just based on our space. Okay. Um, we you know we train on a certain set of machines and then we have people scheduled in different um, work work pods modules actually um, so it's just a matter of fitting the pieces together as far as the people and how we're staffed yeah and then you know once it's like a class of sewers like two or three new sewers graduate into the production line mm. then we have space to hire more okay that's kind of how it goes yeah. yeah so it's pretty i mean it all feels very organic and not like you know there have been tons of instances with small businesses where they scale 
and with that scaling, their overhead scales, and then maybe they have a dip in demand, and so now they have yeah. to lay off or whatever. Yeah, we don't ever want to go backwards. Yeah. You know, always forwards. Or flat and then forwards. Right. But no backwards. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, <laughs> Can you kind of tell me some of the harder barriers for you to break through as a founder and an owner? Um, yeah, well, you know, I've definitely tried to keep it in my comfort zone. Yeah. As we've grown, um, it's it's hard. We're a pretty flat organization. Like we don't, we're not very top heavy. We don't have a lot of management. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a big challenge there as far as like being able to do everything. It's a complicated business to, yeah. to design and produce and sell, um, you know, your own brand entirely in house. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's been a challenge, just, just the variety of tasks that we have to do and, and the amount of learning and, and growing required. Um, and then, yeah, there's also kind of, you're battling the apparel industry, which is, you know, the textile mills are generally set up to sell to bigger makers yeah. that have a certain amount of volume. So when you're just starting out, it's it's really hard to reach that volume. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a challenge for smaller businesses. Yeah. For sure. Um, we're past that point now, which feels good. Right. Yeah. How do you stay motivated through all of that? Um, I, you know, I, my teams motivates me like yeah. the, the 58 jobs that we're supporting and um, just the vibe in the building. Yeah. Feels really good. It feels really good to show up to work. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Um, yeah. Do you feel, I mean, clearly you feel some sort of responsibility for your employees, but do you also have an overarching feeling of responsibility for Leadville as a community? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've always been super Leadville focused. Um, yeah, and Leadville has been really down and out back in the day when we started. Yeah. You know, um, it's changed a lot in recent years, um, but we're still gonna, you know, fight the good fight to try and make sure manufacturing and, and this brand is still a part of this town as long as we can. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're pretty inundated with e-commerce stores or middlemen from all variety where they're sourcing materials from abroad, labor is abroad, you know, everything just kind of happens somewhere else. Can yeah. you give a little bit more on your perspective of the importance of keeping things local? Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of a personal choice. There's a thousand ways to run a business and, and you know, this is just the way we choose to run ours. Yeah. You know, because it's what makes sense to us, and and uh, it feels good. You know, mm -hmm. it feels good for us to do that. And obviously, sourcing in other countries is is a huge part of American business. So, yeah. Or you know, global business. So yeah, that's that's a, another choice you can make as a as a business owner and then as a consumer you can make choices too so you know mm -hmm. support what you want yeah yeah have you encountered any like issues in the outdoor space whether it's you know other bigger established companies moving in on maybe some of your design or materials that you use or even smaller brands like we kind of talked about what have been some of the biggest like hurdles you've had to go through specific to the outdoor industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, for us, we're in the outdoor industry, but mm -hmm. we're also in the apparel industry. Yeah. Which is kind of where the challenges come more, I think. Okay. Um, apparel, like, because it's open. Yeah. Right? And brands aren't very well protected. Um, it's a weird space to navigate. And, yeah. And there's not a lot of sharing amongst companies and stuff so it's been interesting to figure that out and yeah. navigate it for sure do you feel like and have you noticed uh smaller brands setting a trend and then bigger brands kind of taking on that popularity we we see it a lot in the ultralight backpacking space yeah. where materials and design are you know the the smaller creators 
establish that there is a demand. Right. And then, you know, you have people like Big Agnes coming in and, and doing DCF tents all of a sudden. And so have you experienced right. anything like that? Uh, not, I don't know. You know, the bigger brands, they definitely, I mean, everyone copies everybody. Yeah. Right. So it's just part of life. Um, and that's what trends are. Right. Right. So it's just a natural thing, I think. And I haven't really seen our language, design language, show up in the big brands. Yeah. Um, more in the smaller ones. Um, yeah, and who knows, who knows what's going to happen in the yeah. future. I don't know. Speaking yeah. of, what's like the next <laughs> dream 10 years look like for Melanzano? Like if you had your way, perfect market, oh, perfect I don't, world. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Is it a dream or is it a nightmare? I don't know. Okay, that's fair <laughs> enough. No, we're just going to keep growing and um, we have that new space across the street. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what we can do over there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we just want to keep getting more streamlined and, and more professional as a manufacturer, for yeah. sure. Um, we want to adopt new technology um, on the production side and, and we want to move more into natural fibers. Um, a lot of our, we're definitely heavy on synthetics yeah. right now. So, so that's a goal of mine personally, for sure. Do you mean like wool? Sure, yeah, we got some wool coming, okay. possibly, yeah. All right. Sure, yeah. Good guess. Yeah, <laughs> nice yeah. work. Thanks. <laughs> uh, can you kind of tell me about the uh, material replacement, or not replacement, what's the right word? Like, you have materials or fabrics that didn't make the quality control, and you distribute that to local creators, right, or, or local makers? Uh, yeah, we're working on that. We definitely have pretty high standards as far as quality goes. Yeah. Um, uh, our supplier's been struggling with COVID and yeah. supply chain issues, amazingly enough, it's true. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we've had quality issues um, and we're definitely doing our best. We're really focused hard on not wasting fabric. Right. Um, so yeah, we're setting up a little program to, to share our um, some of our reject fabric with local makers. That's um, awesome. And we're also doing our best to get it recycled and repurposed. Yeah. For sure. That's awesome. Yeah. How was COVID for you guys? What was the experience like? I know that there was a lot of kind of turmoil, it seemed, with staff having to deal with, you know, people just kind of showing up. The appointment-based system came into place and it yeah, the supply chain issue. You know, everyone yeah. struggled to yeah, that. Yeah, COVID's been a crazy roller coaster. Yeah, and super expensive. Yeah, um, which is fine. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, we're lucky to be okay um, along the way and be able to make whatever choice we've had to. Yeah, but but yeah, we were closed entirely for two months. Mm -hmm. um, we made masks right. for the local hospitals um, in partnership with them. Um, so that was really cool to be able to do that. Um, then when we, well, then we went online. Yeah. Um, because we wanted to protect our staff and keep working. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to rearrange our production floor for the six foot separation. Yeah. Um, we sold online uh, for uh, 10 months maybe or something for quite a while. Um, we had to create that lottery system because there's so much demand. Yeah. We can't just sell our product online because right. it would just all be gone. Yeah. And it would be a big headache. Um, so, yeah, so we, sh we sold online through a lottery. And then when we were able to reopen our store, we were mobbed. Really? Just mobbed. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, and it was unsustainable because we had no product at all. We get completely cleaned out yeah. um, in the store. So that's when we kind of came up with the appointment system was to just have enough control over how much we were selling on a day-to-day -day basis so we could min maintain some inventory yeah. and have a decent shopping experience. Okay, cool. And we're still refining that. We're still working on our appointment system, mm -hmm. trying to make it better and carry more inventory. Um, and, but we're probably going to stick with it for a while yeah. for the foreseeable future. With the appointment system? Yeah. 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 Do you feel like it's 
benefited the customer and their shopping experience through doing that? I mean, uh, just in the two days. I think days, so. I yeah. mean, we don't always hear about it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we get a lot of grief yeah. for it, but it's, you know, it's a, we don't want to do it, but it's just a necessary evil Yeah. with the demand and the supply. It's just the best way to control it and continue selling in our store yeah. you know, and making it good. Um, because yeah, before it, before the appointments, people would return over and over to the store and come away with not, nothing. Yeah. Or buy the wrong size or the wrong color just to get something and we didn't want that. Right. You know, we want people to get what they want. So if you can plan your trip to Leadville or mm -hmm. ideally plan it around something else. Yeah. You know, if you ski, you know, plan it on a weekend you're up here skiing. Or if you hike in the summer, plan it, you know, make your appointment for a weekend when you're going to come up and climb a 14er. Yeah. And, um, you know, we don't want meet people making special trips. Just for a sweater? Ooh, yeah, we don't want people flying across the country just to buy a hoodie. Yeah. You know, like, like combine a piggyback with yeah. some other joyful mountain activity, which is pretty easy to find around here. Did Before the appointment system, did you have people that flew in from out of state just to get a sweater and then there was, like, nothing available for them? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, um, that's funny. Yeah, people have been pretty obsessed with, with getting the Melanzana, um, which is great. You know, it feels really good to yeah. be popular, but it's also like, it's not really what we're about. Yeah. We're about like core, functional, useful garments. Right. You know, it's not supposed to be a trend. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much a trend. Yeah, I hate well, to break yeah, it to you. It's all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> dig our own grave and we got to lay in it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, is there anything else that you want to go over that we might have missed? Uh, no, man. I feel good about that. Good. Thanks. Well, again, yeah. thanks for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Of course. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Cool.